Well, good morning and welcome to worship this morning. It's good to see all of you here, especially on this uh, chilly Sunday morning, as such as it is. And I uh, just want to welcome those worshiping with us here in the sanctuary or uh, live streaming. Today we're glad to welcome our guest preacher, Mary Beth Danielson, who is uh, a friend of Pastor Cherie's from... Uh, long ago when they were both church members at Trinity United Methodist Church in Racine, Wisconsin. Mary Beth. And then please be sure to read the rest of the announcements in your bulletin so we can care for and respond to our community together. Uh, I'm your worship host, Mitch Ullman, and uh, thankful for my lovely wife, Kit, who is our musician today playing on the organ and the keyboard and the piano and our song leader, Mike Mangan, who will lead us in, uh, in worship hymns today, and also a thank you to our tech team who makes everything happen from up in the balcony. Let's stand and join together in our opening song, Angels from the Realms of Glory. Angels from the realms of glory wing your flight o'er all the earth. He whose sang creation's story now proclaim Messiah's birth. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Shepherds in the field abiding, watching o'er your flocks by night. God with us is now residing, yonder shines the infant light. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Sages, leave your contemplations, brighter visions beam afar. Seek the great desire of nations, ye have seen his natal star. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Saints before the altar blending, watching long in hope and fear. Suddenly the Lord descending, in his temple shall appear. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for at his command they were created. And then please join me in the unison prayer. Christ is born, give him glory. Christ has come down from heaven, receive him. Christ is now on earth, exalt him. O oh, you earth, sing to the Lord. O oh, you nations, praise him in joy, for he has been glorified. Amen. Well, as we're finding our way back to your seats, if the children could come forward for uh, children's time, that would be appreciated. Hello. I see two children. Two will do the trick. Are there any others? Yes, there are. We're going to win. We're going to have four. It's almost a team. Awesome. Anybody else? 
My name is Mary Beth, and I am glad to be here today. And I am a friend of your pastor, and I, she asked if I would be here, and I said I would love to read a story to the children. It's one of my favorites, and maybe you already know it, and if not, we are living in owl season right now. So I'm going to read this story to you. And it kind of talks about being quiet and hearing the things that are out there. It was late one winter night, long past my bedtime, and Pa and I went owling. There was no wind, the trees stood still as giant statues, and the moon was so bright the sky seemed to shine. Somewhere behind us a train whistle blew, long and low, like a sad, sad song. I could hear it through my woolen cap. Pa had pulled down over my ears. A farm dog answered the train, and then a second dog joined in. They sang out trains and dogs for a real long time. Have you heard dogs barking in a winter's night? Yeah, they like to bark at night, don't they? They sang out the trains and dogs, and when their voices faded away, it was as quiet as a dream. We walked on towards the woods, Pa and I. Our feet crunched over the crisp snow and little gray footprints followed us. We get all of the pictures. The grown-ups only get some of them. So that's because you're a little bit more special. Um, pa made a long shadow, but mine was short and round. I had to run after him every now and then to keep up. And my short, round shadow bumped after me, but I never called out. If you go owling, you have to be quiet. That's what Pa always says. I had been waiting to go owling with Pa for a long time. We, we reached the line of pine trees, black and pointy against the sky, and Pa held up his hand. I stopped right where I was. We can go on to the next picture. I stopped right where I was and waited. He looked up as if searching the stars, as if reading them. We went too far. We're going to go back to the picture where Pa and the little girl are looking up into the sky. I stopped right where I was and waited. He looked up as if searching the stars, as if reading a map up there. The moon made his face into a silver mask, and then he called, and this is where I'm going to need some help. Pa called, who, 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 who. Do you know how to say who for an owl? Help me now. Who, who. Hoo, hoo, hoo. Very good, very quiet, because we're calling for a great horned owl. Then he called out again, and then again, and after each call, he was silent. For a moment, we both listened, but there was no answer. Pa shrugged, and I shrugged. I was not disappointed. My brothers all said, sometimes there's an owl, and sometimes there isn't. We walked on. I could feel the cold. You guys can see this picture. We walked on, I could feel the cold as if someone's icy hand was palmed down on my back and my nose and the tops of my cheeks felt cold and hot at the same time. But I never said a word. If you go owling, you have to be quiet and make your own heat. We went into the woods. The shadows were the blackest things I'd ever seen. I. They stained the white snow. My mouth felt furry, for the scarf over it was wet and warm. I didn't ask what kind of things hide behind black trees in the middle of the night. When you go owling, you have to be brave. Who's here is brave? Most of you are brave. You could go owling, then you can tell your dads and your moms later. Then we came to a clearing in the dark woods. The moon was high above it. It seemed to fit exactly over the center of the clearing, and the snow below it was whiter than the milk in a cereal bowl. Now we have the next picture of the father and the little kid looking up. I sighed, and Pa held up his hand at the sound. I put my mittens over the scarf over my mouth and listened hard. And then Pa called again. Help me. Hoo, 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 hoo. Do it again. Hoo, 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 hoo. I listened, and I looked so hard my ears hurt and my eyes got cloudy with the cold. 
Pa raised his hand to call out again, but before he could open his mouth, an echo came threading back through the trees. Now we're being quiet. What did we just hear? Is there an owl in these woods? Yeah. Pa almost smiled. Then he called back, hoo, 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 just as if he and the owl were talking about supper or about the woods or the moon or the cold. I took my mitten off the scarf off my mouth and I almost smiled too. The owl came closer from high up in the trees. Has anyone ever heard an owl flying? It makes a little noise in the woods, doesn't it? That fluff, fluff, fluff. Nothing on the, in the meadow moved. All of a sudden, an owl shadow, part of the big tree shadow, lifted off and flew right over us. We watched silently with heat in our mouths, the heat of all those words we had not spoken. The shadow hooted again. Now we have the back of the owl. Pa turned on his big flashlight and caught the owl just as it was landing on a branch. Then the owl pumped its great wings, this is exactly the right picture, and lifted off the branch like a shadow without sound. It flew back into the forest. Time to go, Pa said to me. I knew then I could talk. I could even laugh out loud. But I was a shadow as we walked home. Did you see this? When you go owling, you don't need words or warm or anything but hope. That's what Pa says, the kind of hope that flies on silent wings under a shining owl moon. Let's say a little prayer right now. Dear God, be with us. Help us to be quiet and hear the things that are beautiful and be with us today. Thank you. Okay? I think you get to go back to sit with your folks. Go oh, now in peace, go now in peace, may the love of God surround you everywhere, everywhere you may go. Saying the words that our Lord Jesus Christ taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now we have the blessing to hear some special music from Mike Mangan. Still a mystery to me That the hands of God could be so small Tiny fingers reaching in the night Were the very hands that measured the sky Hallelujah, hallelujah Heaven's love reaching down to save the world infant eyes had seen the dawn of time 
How his ears had heard an angel symphony Still Mary had to rock her Savior to sleep Alleluia, alleluia Heaven's love reaching down to save the world Alleluia, alleluia Son of God, servant King, here with us You're here with us Jesus the Christ, born in Bethlehem, baby born to save, to save the souls of men. Hallelujah, hallelujah, heaven's love reaching down to save the world. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Son of God, servant King, here with us. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, heaven's love reaching down to save the world. Hallelujah. Son of God, servant King, here with us, you're here with us, you're here with us. Thank you, Mike. That was beautiful. And now I'd like to introduce our guest preacher for the day, Mary Beth Danielson. And she's going to come up and do the scripture reading and give us a word from God that uh, he Thank wants you. us to hear. Thank you. <clears throat> Let's center our hearts. Our Father, our Mother, our Creator, be with us. Let us focus. Let us worship you with our hearts and our minds. Thank you. Amen. Our scripture this morning is easy to read. Would it that it had been this easy for Isaiah, but it's right there in the bulletin. And I'm going to read it while we think together. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robes of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself out with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels, as for the earth brings forth its shoots, as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, for her vindication shines out like the dawn, and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see, shall see your vindication, and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name, and that the mouth of the Lord will give to you. You shall be a crown of beauty in the land of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of your God." That's a big promise. I'm not sure if any of us are up to be a crown in 
in our for our Lord but here we are we are the best that we had that we can be this morning and we are here to worship our Lord and yes I have been a friend of your pastor Sheree for it for more than 20 years she and I were members together at Trinity Trinity United Methodist in Racine and as many of you have noticed she never makes you do anything but as time goes on, you find yourself doing things and going, this is not so bad. Um, I, one of the things that we did a lot when we were both um, in Racine was we walked a lot. And we have kept walking through the years, even when she, she moved away from Racine, she went to seminary, and she moved to all the different communities she's lived in. We don't walk as often, but we still try to keep up with it. And it was just in September of this year that we were hiking in Horicon, and I said, you know, one of my dreams for my retirement is to do a little fill-in preaching. And in the next sentence, she said, I have a date for you. And that is why I'm here. Four months ago, it was four months off, but here we are right now. I know that we're past the busyness of Christmas, or at least the, the most severe busyness of Christmas, and it's now we have a little time to think about what just happened. And that's why I selected the story that I did this morning because it sort of asks children to be quiet and listen to what's going on. And our passages are asking us to do that. And the Christmas story itself does that. And that's what we're going to talk about. Getting past the words and the traditions and all the busyness. What happened here? The story of the birth of Jesus was written 60 to 90 years after his death. And the point of telling it is different for Matthew and Luke, since they were writing to different groups of people. So depending on who we are, and sometimes simply who we are this year, different parts of the nativity story will move in us in different ways. A small child sees the baby who needs to be picked up and loved. Mary and young parents will recognize or see Mary and Joseph and recognize the love one feels when that new baby arrives and no matter what the miracle, how tired you get taking care of that baby. Maybe this year we were the shepherds working the night shift, or the wise men, i.e. people working on their educations, realizing how much further they're going to have to travel, travel on their camels before they get that degree. We who are older now might identify with Anna and Simeon, looking around for signs of God's love and presence in our deeply troubled times. Throughout the Gospel Nativity story, there are so many interesting characters and settings, the angels and the shepherds, people traveling from afar, the long dusty road that Mary and Joseph traveled to Bethlehem, that crowded and unwelcoming village. And then there was that dark sky spangled with stars from one horizon to the other. One star shining brighter than anyone expected to see, marking an opening in the universe that would set what's ordinary akimbo, that would realign the universe, that shines even now for those of us who long to witness God among us. One innocent day last spring, if a day can be innocent, my husband asked me if I would like to take a little getaway to Chester, Illinois in August, because we all know how appealing Southern Illinois is in August. I have been married to him for a very long time. I trust him, but I do not always understand him. What's in Chester, Illinois? It's in the path of totality. The path of totality, right. Aren't we getting a little old for kids? There's going to be an eclipse in August, and there will be a 60-mile path that goes from Oregon to South Carolina, and Chester is inside that path. If we go there, we can see a total eclipse, which I know some of you did too. Sounds interesting. I've seen a few partial eclipses in my life. If you set up a safe method of watching them, you can see the fingernail-shaped shadows in, the, in a bucket of water, and that's kind of cool. The eclipse would be Monday, August 21st at 1.20. So we left home the Saturday morning before, expecting massive traffic driving towards the path of totality. We noticed the traffic wasn't too remarkable. We arrived at our motel by evening, went out to eat, 
took a hike around Cahokia, a pre-Columbian city that is a world heritage site like Machu Picchu, only it's located in East St. Louis next to a racetrack. Go figure. The next day was Sunday. We drove south to check out the Chester Visitor Center, where Len had bought tickets so that we could view from there, knowing that if you're going to go someplace for four hours with your wife, there should be restrooms. We did some other sightseeing. The Mississippi River area around there had been settled by Europeans as in the late 1600s. Fort de Chartres is a French fort. Parts of it that are still standing now were built in 1720. If you read the Outlander books or watch the TV series, not that any of you would, this was approximately the year Jamie was born. One of my favorite years. We needed to be ready to see the eclipse early afternoon on Monday, which meant I saw a rare sight at quarter to six that morning. My husband was up, dressed, and packing and organizing our bags, something I, he does not usually do before coffee, something he doesn't often do at all. So we arrived at, Chester, at the Chester's Welcome Center at 9 a.m. Monday morning. Cool only four hours and 20 minutes until totality, and we were not even the first people there. We set up our chairs, put on sunscreen, sun hats, and sunglasses. We looked at our phones. The place also had Wi-Fi. People kept arriving. We chatted with some of them. We watched airplanes flying into a small airport across the river, rich people who were arriving for the eclipse the easy way. Trains rumbled past beneath the place where we were sitting. Boats and barges were cruising up and down the Mississippi. Traffic zipped on the bridge that was right next to us. I was getting a headache from the sun and the heat, and I was also getting, no kidding around, a little bored. Not sure if I ever wanted to sit on a deck for four hours looking at transportation systems. By noon, the temperature was close to 100 degrees, and since it was southern Illinois, it was so humid you could just about squeeze out the air. We admired the wooden sun-viewing gizmo someone had set up close to us. <clears throat> One aimed its dinner plate size lens at the sun. That made a shadow on the white surface underneath the lens so you could watch the outline of the sun. Every few minutes, someone had to readjust it. The sun really moves that fast. A wonderfully nerdy-looking high school kid had a really big sun-viewing telescope that people were taking turns looking into. We talked to a 70-ish woman who was a wedding photographer from Chicago who said photographing the sky was her passion. Weddings were just her bread and butter. She had several cameras, lots of lenses, plus a notebook with a handwritten choreography of the order of cameras, lenses, and apertures she was going to use in the few minutes the eclipse was going on. Len and I looked like slouches next to many of these people. We only had viewing glasses as well as dark filters that fit over our binoculars. Did I mention how hot it was? We were getting to that point where you don't talk. You just sit quietly and breathe, channeling your inner salamander. And then maybe about 10 to 1, there began to be a buzz in the 200 people milling around on the deck and the lawn and the parking lot. I looked at that sun viewing contraption next to me. Wow, you could see a serious bite out of the sun. There wasn't any difference in the world around us, but that sun viewing contraption showed what was going on, so I kept checking it, and the bite was growing. I was surprised that with more than half of the sun blocked, you could barely see a difference in the amount of light around us. If I hadn't known we were in eclipse, I would not have realized it. Part of me was skeptical. This is the eclipse, a vague graying of the light. And then, friends, at 10 after 1, there was a moment where we went from normal to noticeable dimming, and it was happening fast. That sun that had been blazing for four hours was losing its grip on the sky. The world went quiet. Wind picked up the way it does at dusk, and the temperature dropped. I felt the cool breeze on my arms and neck. Birds stopped chittering in the trees. I heard the abrupt an unexpected buzz of cicadas. 
I don't know when I stood up, but now I was standing, and so was everyone else, and we became quiet as the light of the day around us just disappeared. Suddenly there was a horizon all the way around of blue clouds. It was a total horizon. I had never seen anything like that. And then it happened. The moon slid completely in front of the sun. Vapor light lights in the parking lot came on. People, all of us who had become silent together, began to cheer. Tears leaked from my eyes as I turned to Len, who was also moist-eyed. He shoved the monoculars in my hand. Look! I looked up through the lenses, and there was no sun, just a black hole surrounded by a ring of fire, which is the sun's corona. Leaping and exploding firestorm flames that, scientists tell us, are hundreds of miles high. They are always there, but we never see them, because we mortals can't look at the sun. I stared at the sun that wasn't there and at the world around me for my allotted two minutes. And then, surprising me, I saw a tiny burst of pure white-blue light at the edge of the sun. They call it the diamond ring because for a few seconds that's what you see, the golden corona with a bump of brilliant white light as the moon is now phasing away from the sun. The sun is so powerful that even a tiny, tiny fraction of its light removes complete darkness. Within one moment, the totality was ended, but then there was another moment I hadn't even known to expect. When the available light from our sun is just that diamond of glittering light, our world is otherworldly. The light was intensely blue-white, and there is a silvery sheen over everything. And then, Ordinary was back. Like I say, that all took less than three minutes, less than it took to say it. The tears on my cheeks were still damp. I looked around at the people around me. Everyone seemed as dazed and as dazzled as I was. No one had enough words for what we had just witnessed with our eyes and our hearing and our skin. An older woman, she had said earlier that she was in her late 80s. She literally moaned, Oh, I am so old, I will never see that again. Oh, my. I turned and I suggested as kindly as I could that maybe next time she can see it from the other side. This is terrible theology. But her face lit up and she hugged me. Thank you for that. I'm going to tell my friends at church next time from the other side. The book of Matthew says the shepherds saw a star and then they heard angels singing and then they didn't know what to do so they went to town to tell others what they had seen and heard. Kind of like I just did. How did the gospel story of the birth, life, death and resurrection of Christ begin? Something happened. Something happened here on our earth. The thing that happened happened right here in our eyes, in our heart, while we were together with people we do and don't know. We had traveled to see an event, but didn't even know in the traveling how powerful that event would be. We were living our lives when something broke into our consciousness and made us gasp and feel frightened and joyful and amazed all at the same time. It only lasted a little while, but that moment will, in ways we can't quite explain, changes from here on out. That moment we witnessed is part of who we are now, part of the miracles we know to expect. Something happened. The experience, our Luke passage today is the ending of the traditional nativity story, and it only shows up in this particular way in the book of Luke. It's in um, chapter 2, verses 22 to 40. I've cut out about half of it, but you can certainly read it yourself. When the time came, Joseph and Mary took Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, to present him to the Lord. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. When the parents brought in this little child Jesus, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, For my eyes have seen our salvation, which has been prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for a revelation to the Gentiles and glory to the people of Israel. 
And there was also the prophet Anna. She was very old. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Simeon and Anna, old people now, longing for God to be revealed, felt the presence of God when this little child, son of humble people, was presented to them. The world that had no room for this baby to even be born into, he would be born in that stable. Yet here our disciples and writers are telling us, decades later when they write these stories down, here is the beginning story of our Savior who would have room in his heart for all of humanity and for us. In the beginning, we don't know exactly who this child is. We don't know why these things are happening. We just know something happened here. So those few minutes of the eclipse were over. Time to drive the 400 miles back to Waukesha, about six hours more or less. We got in a car, rolled down the windows. Ah, oh boy, there was a lot of traffic. Well, that was to be expected. Chester is a little town. It would take a while for the traffic to clear out to the highways. Yeah, at 10 o'clock that night, eight hours since we had pulled out of the visitor center, we stopped at a rest area still south of Rockford, Illinois. We had been traveling bumper to bumper at 35 miles per hour for eight hours. We were not even to Wisconsin yet. There was a line out of that woman's restroom, 10 o'clock at night, with about 50 women in it. I got in the line. And then I started to smile. 50 human women who have been in cars with husbands and children for eight hours. That line was chatty. We needed each other. There were comments on how others had tried to get out of the traffic. There was discussion of roads and strategies and apps that were supposed to help but didn't. Someone had her phone out. We could see the terrific traffic jams happening across the United States following major highways north and south out of that path of totality. The country was as striped as a zebra. We were, all 50 of us women, amazingly mortal, complaining, enduring, laughing, and also still a bit dazed. This is the worst mess I've ever driven in. I live in Chicago. My husband will be lucky, lucky if he gets out of this still married. My kids, oh lordy, I love them, but this was too many hours. And then there's going to be another eclipse in 2024. Really? When? From further down the line, April 8th. Will you go to it? Absolutely. That was amazing. The end of a story tells you what the beginning meant. Jesus the baby the child, the man would teach a message that would light the world. Think of the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are those who are unimportant, poor and grieving, who are refugees, who are hurting and lost, because, Jesus tells us, they are the children of God. They are the point of God's story, just as God's love is the point of ours. When we cherish and help, give to and love those around us who need cherishing and help, love and support. That is how we worship our Christ, our God. And now we know what happened here. There was light. There was a hole in the universe where we could see that this story is big, and we are part of it. We are here to worship the baby born right here where something happened. Thank you. Let's stand and join together in our next hymn, God Who Stretched the Spangled Heavens. God who stretched the spangled heavens, infinite in time and place, flung the suns in burning radiance through the silent fields of space. We, your children, in your likeness, share inventive powers with you. 
Great Creator, still creating, show us what yet yet may do. Proudly rise our modern cities, stately buildings row on row. Yet their windows blank on feeling, stare on canyon streets below. Where the lonely drift unnoticed in the city's ebb and flow, lost to purpose and to meaning, scarcely caring where they go. We have ventured worlds undreamed of since the childhood of our race, Known the ecstasy of winging through untraveled realms of space, probed the secrets of the atom, yielding unimagined power, facing us with life's destruction or our most triumphant art. As each far horizon beckons, may it challenge us anew. Children of creative purpose, serving others, honoring you. May our dreams prove rich with promise, each endeavor will become. Great Creator, give us guidance till our goals and yours are one. Please be seated.
Let's join together in our closing song, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain, that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds kept the watching, or silent flocks by night, behold through all the heavens there shone a holy light. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. The shepherds feared and trembled when low above the earth rang out the angel chorus that hailed the Savior's birth. Go tell it on the mountain over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Down in a lowly manger the humble Christ was born. And God sent all salvation that blessed Christmas morn. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain, that Jesus Christ is born. God be in your head and in your understanding. God be in your eyes and in your looking. God be in your mouth and in your speaking. God be in your heart and in your thinking. God be at your end and at your departing. God be in your new year and in your memories of this old year passing. Amen.